There have been some recent changes to the management of diverticulitis, and in this video, I'm going to discuss the current best practices as well as some possible new directions in the management of diverticulitis. It's common for people to develop diverticula, little pockets in their colon, that form when the mucosal layer herniates through the muscle layer of the colon. Most people would never know that they had the condition if it wasn't for a colonoscopy or other imaging. It's common in people who are older, but it can occur even in people in their 40s, sometimes younger. When these pockets become full of pus, a person has diverticulitis, and they will know that they have this because they're going to develop severe abdominal pain, often accompanied by nausea and vomiting and wild swings in their bowel movements, whether that's diarrhea or constipation. And because this is not just an irritated bowel, it is an infected bowel, they will often have a fever. Patients with these symptoms will often make an appointment with their clinic, and with these typical symptoms, they'll likely be diagnosed with diverticulitis. They'll be recommended to keep a clear liquid diet and to keep the pain under control with over-the-counter medications. I often recommend acetaminophen because NSAIDs such as ibuprofen can irritate the GI tract, not what we want at this moment. Antibiotics have been heavily prescribed to manage diverticulitis, but new evidence suggests that most patients with simple diverticulitis don't need them. And this is probably for three reasons. First, antibiotics are not without side effects. We can have the concern for resistant organisms, but as a gastroenterologist, I have particular concern for how they can alter the bacteria that live in your colon, sometimes for the worse, causing separate GI infections. Next, most infections are not actually caused by bacteria. Viruses are the more likely culprit, and as such, antibiotics will do nothing for that infection. Finally, we have a robust immune system, and given time, it will activate against whatever infection you have. And so most people prove to not actually need antibiotics. Clinicians need to make an individual judgment call, though, of whether or not antibiotics are needed. And that's because patients don't always match well against those in a research study that are very typical. For example, a patient that has immunosuppression because they have an organ transplant or they have some other chronic medical condition, this is a person who's more likely to need antibiotics to help control an infection. Time is often a great guide. Part of simple diverticulitis is that it should resolve rather simply. And so if it persists for over a week, this is sometimes a clue that a person is going to need a little bit of help with some antibiotics to get them over the hump. But then we take a patient with irritable bowel syndrome. We kind of expect that they could have a rougher recovery. And so we want to be careful not to just throw antibiotics at them, but perhaps help them with some other guidance. And that might include some specific medications to help stop the cramping spasmatic pain that can accompany diverticulitis and that can help to relieve their symptoms. At times, symptoms can surge and become so severe that a patient will rush to the emergency room. And once there, they're gonna get a lot of blood work and they're likely gonna get a CAT scan of their abdomen and their pelvis. And a CAT scan has been the gold standard of imaging for abdominal pain for a while now. It's very effective for finding diverticulitis, the thickened colon surrounding the pockets of diverticula. Recent interesting literature has shown that an ultrasound is an alternative to a CAT scan that can be quite effective for diagnosing diverticulitis right at the point of care. I'm excited about the use of ultrasound because it can be performed right at the bedside by the ER doc who's been talking with you. That makes it quick, it makes it affordable, and it avoids the ionizing radiation of a CAT scan. Studies have shown that ultrasound can detect many cases of diverticulitis and even some of its complications, such as an abscess, when a loculated pocket of pus gets stuck in your abdomen. That's very important because we need to find those so that we can act upon them. So I imagine a future where we're not immediately using a CAT scan to diagnose patients, but we're reserving it for those patients who have proven to be a tough case after not doing well with antibiotics and not finding what we needed on an ultrasound. Diverticulitis has become increasingly common in the United States with a couple hundred thousand cases a year by most estimates. Why is it increasing? It seems to be in part because of the rising incidence of obesity driven by a diet high in fat, processed meat, particularly red meat, and high sodium. On the other hand, high-intensity exercise, a healthy diet, and high levels of vitamin D have been shown to be protective against diverticulitis. Diverticula are very common, yet most people never get diverticulitis. It seems to be that the people who do are doing so for different reasons than we used to think. The old tale was that you had to avoid seeds and nuts because these got stuck in the diverticula and provoked an infection. Yet new research has undermined that idea. It has actually shown that the people who are eating a diet rich in seeds and nuts 
perhaps actually do better. I'm not suggesting that you go and get an entire bag of sunflower seeds, but there does seem to be reason that it's important to have high fiber and not be worried about specific sources such as those with seeds and nuts. And just as we've thrown out the idea of seeds and nuts, a new concept is taking shape for what causes diverticulitis. And it's thought to be that the bacteria in our colon are what drives the inflammation. Eat the wrong foods and you're feeding the wrong types of bacteria and they become overpopulated in your colon, producing a more inflammatory environment. Eat the right types of foods and you make friendlier bacteria show up and party in your colon, keep it a happy place. Most cases of diverticulitis will be managed by medications alone, but perhaps 10% of cases are complicated by either an abscess, a perforation, or a fistula. And we'll discuss those complications in a separate video. Thank you for watching and be safe.